Hi everyone, it's Glenn Kaiser with the Dolby Institute and we're back again at Skywalker Ranch, the home of Skywalker Sound with Matthew Wood and David Acor to talk about Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. Congratulations on your Oscar nomination. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah I, super exciting. I feel like it was just a few weeks ago that we sat down in, at Dolby Soho in New York yeah. and had a very strange conversation about this film because yeah. I hadn't seen it and you couldn't talk about it. That's right. <laughs> so I'm really glad to, uh, to get it to meet up with you guys again here now that uh, we can actually unpack the film and yes. talk about it yes. a little bit. We yes. still remember what we did, right? Kind of, sort of. It's been about a month or so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> still fresh in my mind. So, David, you are the you're the supervising sound. You guys are both credited as the supervising sound editor, correct? correct. Editors, yes. and you also did sound design, correct. Uh, on the film. This is your second nomination, I think. Second nomination. The first was for Force Awakens. It was Force Awakens. You, you guys were both nominated for that. Yeah. And this is your fifth nomination, Matthew. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of the Star Wars films, and uh, there will there will be blood and Wally and Wally. Yeah. And do you wear the same tux, or do you have different? Tuxes I have. Every time? Uh, I think I have three. All right. Yeah, because it's time is you know it's been a, over ten years. I can't wear the the blue one anymore. So. <laughs> with the with the ruffles. Yeah, the ruffles. <laughs> the cummerbund I'll still use, but. Yeah. Well, um, now that we can actually talk about the film. I, let's unpack it from like the beginning, Exegol, which is a really uniquely sounding place. Tell me about, tell me about revisiting the Emperor, the sort of the sound treatment around the Emperor, and this this kind of crazy, dark, forbidding planet of Exegol. Uh, yeah, I can. We can talk about the dialogue with the Emperor. Oh yeah, sure. Kind of so thing with he, Snoke. Yeah, Ian uh, McDermott uh, came back obviously to do the to reprise the role again. The actor who originally played him in the first trilogy back in the eighties. Yeah, back in the eighties, and also he in the prequels as right. well as uh, uh, Senator Palpatine. So he he came back, and we really wanted this uh, Exegol to have this dark, foreboding sort of environment. So we we put him uh, in in the speakers. We we had him all across the front LCR in the top. So every time he spoke, it was like this voice of God kind of thing. You were making good use of Dolby Atmos. We absolutely did. Sense. That was a yeah. great use of Atmos for that. And um, he, uh, we used a, a really big, I think the reverb delay time was like 20 seconds or something <laughs> yeah. ridiculous like that. But he, uh, so he came in and, and you know, we, we did a lot of his part uh, in production, but then there was a lot of looping as well. Um, multiple multiple sessions but one of the things we did was really in interesting with him is we wanted to tell the story of how he was manipulating Kylo from the very beginning and we had this idea to have him one of the sentences when he says I have been every voice you have ever heard inside your head I went out and recorded um, uh, James Earl Jones and Andy Serkis and we had them all complete that sentence so we had them come in and read that 50 different ways and then we had uh, Ian do it as well and so we had that kind of bridge together to make that sort of sound design dialogue moment. So you had Snoke and Vader and the Emperor. Yeah, sort of. to kind of tell that story about Snoke. And we had, and there was a couple of shots that Roger and the folks had put in of Snoke in the tank and all that, like mm -hmm. uh, proto, proto Snokes in the Bucket tank. Bucket of Snokes. Yes, <laughs> Bucket, Bucket of Snokes. Snokes. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, I love that. I love that whole environment. And Dave 100% complimented that with the amazing ambiences and lightning force effects. Yeah, that was um, the the sort of the mandate for Exegol was uh, tense and, and scary, um, horror movie-like. Right. Um, even the, the lab, the Emperor's lab, is sort of uh, you know, reminiscent of Frankenstein's lab, that kind of thing. Uh, we had, a, I made some lightning for it that was sort of, rem it was lightning adjacent sound effects for, for Exegol. Now, and, and, and is that, what relationship does that have to force lightning? Is it sort of this? Is it is it kind of no, in the same? No, or no relationship. Conceptually, completely different. Completely different. So, and I, I, I the, to that end, uh, the lightning I had made for Exegol was um, to JJ's ears a little too close to lightning, hmm. uh, too too on the nose for lightning, and he was afraid that later in the movie it might sound too much like force lightning. Right. We wanted it to be as differentiated as possible, all the sounds to be completely unique from each other, which is great. Uh, I just didn't go far enough with it. So the next pass, uh, he, he, his suggestion was to go like just animalistic, guttural, screechy, creepy, brain melty, you know, crazy lightning. The lightning is coming from the center of the planet out right here rather than down. It was so it's this different version of lightning, so it can't sound like traditional lightning. So we went with this you know, just 
horrible, like screeching, you know, metallic sounding uh, lightning shrieks that sometimes are preceded by this sort of crackly rumble and it's sort of, you know, thing that happens. Um, which is basically what he described how he wanted it to sound, and I just kind of made that. <laughs> and uh, pro, pro tip: when the director gives you an imitation of what they want, use yeah. that. Yeah. Go yeah. for that yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, and so, uh, and that's kind of how um, a lot of the the movie goes. So, is where you you, you prepare um, your ideas, your sound design ideas, and some things get kicked back, some things right. uh, are approved. And when they, something gets kicked back, you sit down with the director and you hash it out until you know everybody's happy with what they're hearing so um yeah that's basically the evolution of the exegol lightning um on that was it was a bit of a back and forth and what we ended up with was this totally bizarre scary um kind of catches you off guard because uh, there's a lot of lightning flashes down there. there's a lot of very stroby lightning and we don't right. want to hit every one of those because sure. that just gets it would get exhausting exhausting so we played around with the placement of that just some the the heightened uh, tension moments when it, it's the most tense or the suspense is kind of hitting its peak and then maybe even wait a couple more beats and then hit you with that shrieky right. lightning um, just to kind of help sell the idea of this scary environment that they're in. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about um, kind of the way you guys work with uh, director J.J. Abrams. Mm -hmm. um, is, is somebody embedded down in the cutting room with them yeah. to, to yeah. Sort, of, sort of kind of walk us through the process of like when do you guys start sending stuff down and and, and how to how does well, kind we, of how, how do things flow we came on in it was around the first time we read the script was in september of 2018 18. so mm -hmm. uh we went actually uh kathy kennedy had us go to pinewood studios in london you had to go to London to read the script. Yeah, yeah, but it, but there, it was a two-part thing. I mean, she's actually been really amazing with uh, including sound in the process yeah. very early on, and that was something that was handed down from George Lucas. Sure. And so we would go out, read the script, and actually go to the set, meet the props guys, go to all the, the sets that they had up, the little locations they had around. We went through like a walk through the creature department and get to see the droid do and actually how it works and mm -hmm. hold the lightsabers in our hands and that kind of stuff so that was quite and inspiring talking, talking yeah. to jj too. yeah we, and we tried to you know we, he was shooting the day one the first day we were there it was the first day um billy d williams was coming to the That's set right. yeah. and a lot of people i mean uh, don't even know that that was happening i mean they, they would distribute sides on a daily basis in a little plastic sheet that you had to return at the end of the day or you didn't come back the second day for work i mean they were very much very secretive about the script. And so a lot of people on the crew didn't even know that Billy D was gonna be there that day. They had him like hidden behind a little screen and ladies and gentlemen, Billy D. Williams. So we got to be there and I'm sure the crew that. went crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it was raining. It was at the base where he's sitting with Jana and she's telling him like at the very end, like right. where she's from and that they shot that scene. Um, and I remember it was raining that day a little bit. So we all had to like huddle under the, the, the Millennium Falcon as the rain, uh, <laughs> you know, so we're looking at each other like this like, is pretty fun. Yeah. But yeah, we would talk to JJ about, you know, we kind of hit the, it was mainly Dio yeah. and, and, um, and how we were going to handle the emperor's transformation and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, any special voices or anything like that, but he, he's shooting. So we didn't really want to yeah. take him so far away from that, but we read the script there and did that meeting for about a week and it was fantastic because it's very inspiring we go back and, and take that information back with us to the ranch but so uh, you come yeah. back and then you start building an, an effects library based on what you've seen and kind of what you read in the script and what you know is coming the first thing we did uh because we ended up talking with jj the most about it was work on dio's vocal okay that was our first you know um design but that's uh, that's jj's voice isn't it it, it was not initially. No, no, oh, really? No, no. Yeah, yeah. It, went, it went through some uh, some options. So I, I made just a bunch of do vocal options. I had a little quick time of a scene. I was cutting different versions. Um, just here's here's a variety pack. You know how, how you know warmer or colder for any right. of these. Sure. And it kind of zeroed in on a couple, and then kind of zeroed it again, and kind of and again, and we got to a point where I was like, okay, this is do's vocal, and it was sort of a, a light whistly sound that he, he kind of made a very simple whistle, airy whistle sound, and made a library of that and passed it along to your question. We had, there's a guy that works for Bad Robot regularly. His name's Robbie Stambler. Uh, he's usually their embedded sound guy, works a lot with the picture department, um, uh, curating sound effects and that kind of thing. 
handed off our library of Dio vocals to him, and that was the first handover we did. That would have been December of 2018. Yeah. Yeah. And then, as things happen when you're working on a movie, you know, the ideas change, and sure, um, that the the idea for Dio's vocal evolved. Right. Yeah. So what was the first sequence that got handed over to you guys? We uh, got... Speeder chase? Yeah, the speeder chase, um, all the DO sections. We were using this uh, system called Atris to pass stuff back and forth so JJ could evaluate it on his iPads and it was all very secure and encrypted. Right. Um, but then Robbie uh, would get sequences. And you're hoping he's not listening on earbuds. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, he's pretty tech savvy. JJ's yeah. pretty amazing. So he'll, he'll give us... To do he'll put on some nice headphones and, and do that for us but um the we got reels actually um fairly early on to, i think of any of the star wars movies we've worked on yeah just to kind of get the keep the temp mix going because the instruction was you know robbie had to keep the temp mix going so they could continually screen jj likes to screen for his internal uh right. you know Folks or and, where he'll have a friend in from out of town and he'll like, he may, he may want to screen at any yeah, point, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so Bad Robots got that, all that facility there. So they were able to screen the movie right off the Avid continuously. So as we got closer to more uh, higher VIP level screenings towards later on, we, Dave and I would come down and we'd actually mix it inside their theater with a... What, and just 5.1 or what? How in 5.1, yeah. 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 So yeah. we would stay in 5.1 in, in the Avid. And we'd keep everything in the Avid just because of the fluidity of the cut was happening so quickly. It was hard to, you know, AAF back and forth and all that. So it's a very genteel way of saying that yeah. <laughs> things were volatile and it was changing up until the last yeah, I mean, that's, that's second. kind of the way. I mean, the, all these movies, you know, happen in post, all these Star Wars yeah. big films. And so that that's something you have to just plan for. And, yeah. and, and the best way to do it is we would just come down and power through a, a hard weekend and get the temp mix in shape and then they'd play it on the Monday and sometimes they'd have to make a DCP other times they just play right out of the Avid right um, mm -hmm. to keep those VIPs happy and then you pre-mixed um, effects here in dialogue in Los Angeles mm -hmm. at Fox mm -hmm. yeah with Andy Nelson yep. and then um, and then the final happened and so did was JJ much of a presence during the premixes or did you did not, you really didn't see him until not the really no I mean most of the conversations we would have would be during temp mix time or it, or it'd be something that would come up that he'd hear we, we we didn't want to put a spotlight on a lot of things like hey what do you think of this sound effect right now in this thing out of context sure you know you it's best to play things in context we yeah. find and you know how it's going with because the, the temp music is a big uh, factor there and, and, and that, that was that's the big driving force be behind not playing things out of context especially sound effects if you just play the sound of a speeder in a vacuum here's the sound of the speeder by how do you even you know how do you judge that yeah. and if you're sure if you're if you're you know maybe the director if you're JJ you're also thinking about like a million other things story and music and everything else it's just you know yeah. you, how do you accurately even well, I'm glad you brought that up because I certainly, you know, it's a hallmark of the Star Wars films and sort of the cinematic language of the Star Wars films that we've all grown accustomed to is there, I would say, I would describe it as music forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a For lot sure. of score, you know, I think yeah, sure. if, if the, if a Star Wars movie is 120 minutes, there's going to be 118 minutes of music. <laughs> yes. um, so how do you, when you're thinking about sound effects, how do you, do you, are you anticipating that or you, you, you can't really, when do you start to hear the score for the first time? Are you hearing mock-ups? How, well, how, how does that work and how does it affect your work? You're cutting against uh, temp music, against mock-ups, um, which is usually um, older John Williams pieces, you know, from, the other, <laughs> from Star Wars. From yeah. Star yeah, Wars, yeah. 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 So it's, it, you're, you're, um, you're in the, you're probably, probably in the ballpark when you're cutting against that temp music. It, it does change when you get the real score, and you don't usually get the real score on most movies, including this one, until the final. Until mix. the final, right. yeah. yeah. So, so you you're really not in a situation where you say, ah, "I'm not going to bother covering that because I know it's going to be covered." You know, you have to cover everything. Yeah, you have to cover everything. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, they re you rely on yeah. So Chris Carabozio was our um, effects mixer, effects and foley mixer, and you rely you know heavily on the mixers to um, make those differentiations between is this a music moment, is this an effects moment. And then there were cases in this movie where JJ decided to just pull music out, you know, right. and then that's for those moments where you're thankful that you're that you covered it, you're covered and you're prepared. So it's just not totally exposed. I mean, you have to remix at that point yeah. if you're prepared for it to be a music moment and suddenly it's an effects moment. Can you give a, I'm just curious. Can you give an example of a, of a, of a moment in rise of Skywalker that became a, an effects moment that you weren't anticipating? 
uh, the beginning of the speeder chase. Oh, that's right. And then also some of the shots of Exegol. I think then we take there yes. was the, and 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 I got to say John Williams was came to the final mix a few times. Yeah. And every time it was to actually he'd be like, you know what you could do here, you could take that out. You yeah. know, there was he was very gracious. It was never a he wasn't precious about it. No. no, it was never like every note's got to be heard. He was just what's doing right for the story here, and yeah. and so he he made some suggestions that were actually removing of removing I think music. Yeah. The majority of the top side uh, Death Star lightsaber fight had music at one point, and right? That got all lifted out so that until Kylo walks through the wall of water, and then yeah. the music comes in again. Yeah, which right. I think was fantastic was because yeah. it, it just really made it feel more threatening and real and when that opening when they're, they're they're starting their fight there it was the the tie flip where she flips over kylo's tie that had music at one point and we pulled that out so that was that's a fun effect that's a moment. stunning moment yeah. yeah so that's really cool We're yeah tell me a little bit about the, the construction of that sequence from a set from a uh, from a sound design standpoint because it starts with you know she hears uh, yeah she hears kylo's tie fighter mm -hmm. before she sees it right so you, you, it's it's just a speck in the distance and uh the sound of the the wind vaguely sounds like a distant TIE fighter. It's just sort of that, is that a TIE? Is that wind? And then it's sort of that cut back and forth. And every time you cut to Kylo, it's just a little bit more powerful. It's a little more powerful. And now he's engaging the thruster. And now we're outside and the rocks are kicking up in our face and it's hit another gear. It's even possibly faster and stronger. He's and shifted up. He's shifting it up, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, <clears throat> as he finally approaches her and she does that, that slow motion flip, that was a moment where we kind of had a little bit of a back and forth about um, what that sound is. Is there no sound? There was a moment there where that just went completely silent, mm. where she flips over. And then we went uh, past where all you heard was you know, the flap of her cape, the cloth flap and the saber slice. And then there, we added some rocks. And then there, there was a, a point where you know there was an argument to hear maybe a hint of the TIE fighter. So we did this sort of sustained tie scream and heavy reverb that was you know kind of a little dreamy state there and that's kind of where it landed but um that's a really fun sequence and that yeah. actually to, to speak to your sound effects there because i'm a huge fan <laughs> <laughs> uh, but i just love it like we have so many classic sounds in star wars you know tie fighters and lightsabers and chewbacca, the falcon and right. chewbacca and all that um, that we've been able to keep sacred in the in the restricted library here at, at, at Star Skywalker Sound, mm -hmm. but the fun thing is, like for a sequence like that, I mean, we only really have a few pass bys and of Tie Fighters that were created back in the day by Ben Burt. So it's you know Dave's job to cre create all those new, but they have to also sound like it has to be in the same universe, the same right? universe. And so that whole sequence there it was a lot of new Tie Fighter effects to, to, to make that work. Yeah. So. You have new TIE fighters. So, so th yeah. this, this teed up a question that I would. So if you have new lightsaber stuff, new TIE fighter stuff, mm -hmm. new Chewbacca stuff, do you kind of dissect the way those sounds were originally built and recreate them? Or what's your, yeah. what's your approach to that? Yeah, that, that's, that's the, the best and most straightforward approach is to just sort of, well, Ben Burt still works at Skywalker. We still sure. see, see Ben every morning um, at breakfast. And uh, he's, a, he's, he's, he's an open book. You can ask Ben whatever you want about Star Wars. And I've known Ben for almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've definitely learned um, everything I know about Star Wars sound from Ben. Obviously, who else would you learn that from? Right. But one of the things is, as far to your question about TIE Fighters, is you know what's the recipe for making the sound of a TIE Fighter pass by? And it's this elephant scream, and this uh, uh, that's the, the main sound, is that tie scream. But then there's this race car on wet pavement sound that kind of goes under it. And so to make my new ties, just take that recipe, slightly different ingredients, and make new tie fighters. So there's elephant scream, but it's a different elephant scream. And I tried some other animal, you know, horrible screams and yells <laughs> and uh, different vehicle pass bys to kind of lay in with it. Uh, and I think what we ended up with was sort of this um, maybe next gen TIE fighter sound that kind of uh, we used uh, for that scene and then later in the movie in the big space battle. And then I, I'm just curious, you know, one of the, for me, one of the most heartbreaking moments of the film is when Chewbacca finds uh, out about Leia's death. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's a, and, and that sound that he makes is just. Jonas, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jonas, um, uh, who, 
who's in the who's, suit. The, the actor who's performing. Yeah, the actor yeah. in the suit has, uh, he's, he can actually do some great vocalizations really? himself. Yeah, we used, I think it's the only, the only one that's in there is the, when they get captured. Oh, he makes that kind of When they all get sound. captured when it's, uh, and uh, uh, he's, he has that little plaintive cry that he does, like, I can't even do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, that's, that's actually doing us. And I don't know, like we, I know you guys worked on that, the reaction to Leia's death. That's a fax. Yeah, yeah, that was a fax. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just fun to watch him on set. And like and speaking also to JJ and his involvement in our in our sound creation process, I know like for example, BB eight, um, we have a library of BB eight sounds sure. that have been created over the last few films. Um, and it's very dear to JJ's heart, that character. And I know that he really wanted to make sure we just didn't, you know, put in samples again for what you just reuse other yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. And so we actually went through with Dave and they and and JJ. There's a way, a uh, tactile way for JJ to actually be involved in the performance of, of BB-8. Really? So, yeah, they spent a long time creating yeah. a lot of new, line, new tracks, line by line for BB-8. Just uh, that very first uh, one, I think, is the the one where when the tree crashes. Oh him, yeah. And he's like, "Hello, uh, yeah. I'm over here." <laughs> yeah. Like, "Hello." I get to like, laugh every time. It's yeah. that that was so great to hear because those didn't come in till kind of late in our process and yeah. so i always love that when we're working on the film and then we're actually laughing and, and enjoying it and that was one of the first things in the premiere yeah. when we watched it that like everyone was cracking up at the yeah. his, uh, little, his plaintive little look i'm there. a star wars geek i saw the movie three times in the theater i got to laugh every time i saw oh, it. oh cool <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um i want to ask you about carrie fisher um, mm -hmm. obviously who who passed away yeah. after uh, after the last film and yeah. so her performance in this film was uh, kind of pieced together from yeah. outtakes and scenes that weren't used in Force Awakens. Is that yeah? Correct? So we we it, we had a lot of outtakes from Force Awakens uh, that we were able to pull from visually to get her. And they've cra you know Chris Terrio and JJ uh, Chris Terrio the writer uh, went and kind of structured scenes around what they had for her reactions. Right. We really you know Carrie Fisher is like the soul of Star Wars. We love her and we was such had, a loader for yes, to not I have mean, her on this film. Yeah. Yeah, she passed away, you know, after we had finished Last Jedi, um, the previous movie. So this movie we had not no and nothing that was intended to be in this movie. So everything was repurposed and we really wanted to treat that with respect. And uh so audio wise we were able to uh bring things in uh, from those same outtakes we actually and I actually mined a lot of her um, behind the scenes footage really yeah that we had uh, huh. a lot of uh, material from and so a combination of technology and an editorial we were able to make those work and it's all her voice so it's everything is from Carrie um, and yeah we just we treated that with respect and, and, and even the younger Carrie that's in the flashback sequence when she's learning the force right. or, or doing her final trials with Luke in the forest there that's actually we brought in Billy Lord, her and, daughter, and then her daughter, and she yeah. she vocalized for us, and she also I believe was the body model or body for when they shot that, and they used footage from Return of the Jedi um, for her face and when the mask gets lifted up. So we wanted that to really work, and, um, and yeah, and, and, and you, you certainly she, didn't want to bring a sound alike in or right. any kind of nonsense like that. Right, that would have been really yeah. yeah, yeah. So we were very happy to be have that all be sourced from Carrie and and uh, JJ had some note from Carrie or some, something from Carrie that said something about they were going to work together again and that was at the end of Force Awakens when right. JJ had no idea that he would that he was going to direct this film right yeah, yeah so he kind of felt that that was a connection to something otherworldly in a way that they mm -hmm. were together. and she I think she would have really enjoyed the way she was portrayed and, and how the send off of the character was. It's extremely you know. respectful. Yeah. And then of course, you know, knowing what you know, when the character dies in the film, right. it's just, it's especially. Yeah. Sacrificing herself to, you know, to keep the sun and, and Ray from fighting and all that, like, you know, and to, to bring that gravitas to the situation. I think that was a big turning point for all the, you know, all the characters in the movie, that death was really well handled. Mm -hmm. And f just from a construction of the film standpoint, that, that whole sequence between with the fight with Ray and yeah. and and Kylo and then her death and then it kind of it kind of culminates in this you know sequence where where you know Ben is talking to you his know father. Han Solo yeah. to his father mm -hmm. and certainly the first time you hear Han Solo's voice yeah like, hey kid yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Adam's the, performance in that is just phenomenal yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, the, the audience that I was with the first time you hear Han Solo's voice, they just they lost their yeah. they lost their minds. Yeah, I'm impressed that that was kept as uh, spoiler free as as it was. It seemed like it anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any of that got out. Yeah, yeah I didn't see anything. Well, and yeah. I wanted to ask you from a, just from a sound perspective because but you know it's such a shocking moment and it almost felt like I mean you're on the you, you know you're on mm -hmm. the world with the ruins of the Death Star there's this crazy storm going on mm -hmm. there's from there's a cacophony of sound but I feel like you guys almost took everything out yeah that, pretty much and it's yeah. really just the their voices it's, it was a mirroring was, of the scene in in Force Awakens in a way like we tried to like when they're on the on the, the catwalk you know, thing catwalk, actually kills yeah. them. you know there's even lines of dialogue that are the same from that scene but bringing it very minimalist there and there was even an instruction at one point to have the hey kid line come in on a on a gust of wind like it was almost mm. like he was a ghost or some form of you know apparition where it, in his mind but it was going to be like hey kid you know like and that all happened off screen um but yeah very very yeah, minimalist. yeah. With everything kind of tames down basically once he starts speaking and we kind of get more inside there inside kylo said i guess you'd say sure get kind of really small and intimate in that moment yeah and yeah. we didn't have to loop harrison which i was grateful for <laughs> like yeah. i just i want just I, I i really want the life of that scene to yeah. just be what they performed and yeah because we, we did have to loop a couple things in when in harrison's death scene in the previous movie and that's always a challenge you're like God, it's so, hard such, to get them it's, it's hard to get yeah. them into that headspace i mean he's obviously a professional and everything worked great but it's just it's so much better when you can it's a big ask hold on to the original yeah. which you know um stuart wilson's recording on this film was the our production recordist was fantastic and that man loves star wars and is such a artist at his job and yeah the, the tracks we get from him are incredible so our dialogue team of uh cheryl nardi and james spencer and rich quinn had to you know yeah. cut that all together and make that happen and, and we salvaged we used a lot of production in the movie which yeah. was great it's really unusual on a star wars movie yeah <laughs> yeah i know i mean i did do a considerable amount of looping on the job as well but it was you just have to cover your bases as far as what's going to work. Now, do you still have your portable ADR studio on your on your MacBook uh, that, you run, that you run around and I do. record all over the world? I recorded the majority of the ADR in the movie. Yeah, so I went to Bad Robot, actually. recorded a lot there. Um, went to various hotel rooms and all over the world. And So how does it work? Do you have a laptop and you actually have... Do you do, you do like streamers and pops mm -hmm. and the whole thing? Streamers, beeps. I've got a headphone monitoring system. Uh, I've got you know all the plugins so I can do the when we play it back it's got the reverb correct and everything and yeah it's just something JJ is ensconced down there at Bad Robot when he's cutting so I I make everything a point. comes to JJ yeah so there's two or three rooms there that I can bounce into and create a quick looping stage and when they're doing any pickup shooting I try to get down there and because like, sure. all the actors are there and um, I just want to make it as my, my goal is to make it as easy and effortless as possible for the director just to be able to pop in and do the looping and and not have to go away and go s somewhere and do it yeah um we did do uh some sessions in london with goldcrest uh, with mike tarani and he was great i've used him on all the star wars films so what's the what's the oddest place you've done an adr recording session um the la the very last recording we did was uh we had to change the lines of kylo when he had his mask on and I had to fly out to New York and get, you know, Adam was in the middle of doing press for the 14 movies he's on right now. <laughs> he's and had a busy year. He has. And yeah. I saw him in yeah. the spring, on, you know, and burn this on Broadway. So right, some, I did too. somehow, somehow I he to managed to wedge yeah. a whole Broadway run in the middle of this. It was incredible. Extraordinary yeah. string of work. So he, I went to his house um, in Brooklyn and we ended up having to there, there was so many rever he, he had just got a new area to work like his office yeah. and so there was no furniture and so i had to come in there and like, it was just an echo chamber yeah so i ended up opening up one of his closets where he had all of his suits and i just pushed the suits out of the way <laughs> and it said hang your head in here and i put the mic in there and i gave him the headphone and i fed everything in there and i closed the doors behind him and pushed him into the room so <laughs> <laughs> so we did those three. and I was able to like get source connect connected to JJ back in LA and then oh so he monitored the session. oh he monitored I, that's the other thing that we do we do it live so he, JJ can be watching I have a laptop set up for JJ with source connect so he can watch in sync wow and so then we looped those last two or three lines in uh stuffed in there and then and then yeah JJ and then uh, Adam left to go do like Seth Meyers show like immediately after that but that was kind of a strange one and the other one was for Ian McDiarmid, 
when we were doing the emperor stuff there was a, a vo that we wanted to change where he's explaining to all the things that are going to happen bad to her friends if he if she doesn't sacrifice him and that was kind of a, a montage sequence and we wanted to change some of the dialogue there we couldn't get ian was like way in remote scotland where he lives <laughs> and doesn't have good wi-fi can barely pick up cellular coverage but i was able to get a little apogee microphone sent to him and I told him over the phone how to hook it into the iPhone and, and, and work it. And I presume he is not terribly tech savvy. No, not really. <laughs> He's the sweetest guy ever. Um, it's so fun to listen to him like talk all sweetly. And then he goes right into the emperor. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> wow, amazing voice. So, so he, uh, yeah, I gave him that mic and it was a time difference. So he's up really late after a party and he's like, I'm going to have to wait till the wind dies down because he's right on the ocean. And so he recorded all these scenes and I'm, I'm listening. He had another phone that I could listen to him with. And then we got the recordings and you have to send it through uh, iMessage. So he's trying to send it and it's not the little zip files not going. And he had to walk down to the beach like in the middle of the night, <laughs> lightning storm. So he he's trying to find cell coverage, <laughs> cell coverage. <laughs> to see that the thing says delivered on my iMessage to me. And he's yeah. like, and I'm like, oh, please don't let the emperor get struck by lightning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, killed. the irony. Uh, yeah. And he said it was yeah. like being on Exegol. <laughs> it was exactly the same. Like, <laughs> big lightning everywhere. And we got those files and put them in like, like you know, three days before we finished. But those were fun times. That's why you needed it right away because you guys were coming down to the wire. We were coming down to the wire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things. I mean, that's that's sort of the method. I think he, you know, when, when we're in the final mix, it's go time for JJ. And we're all, and we have such a crew that, you know, we just need to know we have all the options available for him. Sure. And I think. Well, he likes to play on the he final He likes to play. Stage. And yeah. that's yeah. His, his moment. I mean, he's worked with Andy Nelson forever and Chris Garabosio on a few films now. And all of the crew that we had on our film had done time with them and understood like that, the nature of how this is. And we actually, I think. He had a great crew. I had just, a great crew. Just to yeah. kind of mention our crew. Personally. Yeah, no, no. I wanted to give you guys yeah. an opportunity. Obviously, yeah. you have the you have the nomination, but you you, you did not do this by yourself. No, no so no, please, no, no. yeah. You yeah. you mentioned a, a few folks in the editorial team, but yeah, yeah. anybody you, you want to give a shout out to? Yeah, so uh, I just like an A list um, effects editing crew of uh, Addison Teague and Justin Doyle, um, uh, cutting effects, um, uh, Foley editing. We had D Selby and Richard Gould. Um, had this great Foley walking crew of uh, uh, Ronnie Brown and Blake Collins, Frank Ranella, Margie O'Malley, mm -hmm. and uh, Koya Elliott um, was a was kind of an effects assistant for us in the show. Yeah, and then so yeah, dialogue I kind of mentioned already, but yeah, and we had an assistant uh, Trey Turner. Yeah, as well. Did you but mention dialogue already? I did. It was like yeah, I, when I was talking about who cut all the oh the, okay the stuff, but we can say it again. Uh, that's good. You start <laughs> Cheryl, talking, my Cheryl, mind just kind of like yeah, just counting just, the blinds in the window over there. Anymore. I just, Is he still talking? It's, it's a droning on and on. <laughs> When's my turn? <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl Nardi, James Spencer, Rich Quinn. Yeah, so we uh, we had a great a crew for all that. Yep. But surprisingly, not a huge crew. Not a huge crew. No. No. No, not at all. I mean, but we. Uh, but that's been that's been kind of the norm for you guys on the Star Wars films. It's it's a it's yeah. a it's a small it's a small band of of very uh, talented folks. Yeah. And, but you guys had them on for for a while. Longer, yeah. We yeah. our crew our crew time is usually longer. That was a George thing too. He always liked fewer people on longer time. Right, right. Um, sometimes I would joke, just the way things come together with JJ. Sometimes I would be like, oh, well, just no one will work on it until the last month, and we'll hire fifty people and like. Yeah. But that, that wouldn't work either. I mean, JJ really that has a personal. That is, that is an approach that other people do. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah. now that we've done, this will be, you know, I think I helped out on the first Star Trek with Ben. And then, but then we, I think we've had like close to five films with JJ, with JJ now. And I, he likes the familiar faces and he's, yeah. he's a very personable, like, you know, knows our names and like, sure. it's very like involved in our process. And so I, I think it's nice for him to see familiar faces. He knows our names. Well, I just mean on the stage. It's not like he's like, you make you, that you, work. You, yeah. you, you he's, sound he's, person. He's, the best. Yeah. he's very, very involved in you know, yeah. our crew choices and, yeah. and that kind of thing. So For sure. And yeah. So we've, we've talked about some of the major kind of set pieces. We also, there were some fun new characters in this one. Yeah. Like Frick and what? Claude. I love yeah, Claude. Claude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to kind of just ask you guys, are there any other like really your favorite sound moments from the film that maybe maybe are the less obvious ones, but that you kind of 
kind of make you pleased as, uh, as my you favorite know, is his I, I my favorite i will always be my favorite is uh palpatine giving his big force lightning up to the entire fleet is like hands down I, I just laugh i love it it's a, so unorth- unorthodox what you've done it was a it was a jj jj sort of uh, idea uh, again um he has the grass the, the, uh, he has the best sound ideas uh, when it comes to these things um so it was this is when the emperor is emperor's, activating the fleet you he's know? he's yeah. he's gonna uh fire you know the ultimate blast of you know force lightning into the sky and take down the rebel fleet right disable their ships and uh he's just got this you know overhead shot of him and he just kind of does this boom and so we had like a big powerful electrical force blast in there and jj's like oh jj says yeah you know could be cooler and uh you know what what if like what would it sound like if you're in that room like and it just like blows out the microphone and just like you know just just, your brain can't even comprehend the sound like what would that sound like like okay so i made a thing yeah, and uh, I the, made a thing. The, the, <laughs> so the, the root sound is like this electric toothbrush on like a piece of uh, sheet metal. I think I'd recorded not specifically for that, but I, I had had in my um, in my library, and uh, I took that sound because it's got like this sort of ratty metallic sound to it, and I just started blowing it out. Um, I just sort of overdriving it, overdriving it, adding more low end, and it just sort of turned into this <laughs> thing that he does when he. Fires it up and super Atmos too. Chris went nuts. Oh yeah, that just one. Yeah. totally Atmos moment there. And, <laughs> well, sure, because um, the ships are over your head. Yes. Yeah, and JJ <laughs> JJ heard that it was like great. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, sold. That's so fun. yeah, that's a fun moment. And and Babu Frick is actually um, Shirley Henderson, the actress um, who were, who we remember as Moaning Myrtle. That's right. right. Yeah, from yeah. the Harry Potter movies. Yeah. And yeah. and the funny thing was, I, I didn't know that. So when you know we go through the list with JJ early on, I kind of go through and like, are these characters, because we have puppeteer voices and temp voices and all there. So I'm like, how many of these things are you feeling like you're married to? And do you want me to go out? Because I have a great loop group with Terry Douglas. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll go out and get, you know, 25 actors to do all kinds of great voices for the show. And I was told that's the puppeteer voice. That's And so and I was like, okay, well, typically we usually replace, replace that. that. Right. So I went and investigated some folks and then, but like, even for me, I was like, God, that's a really good, like, it's <laughs> funny like it's really it's funny. really funny yeah and uh i was like are we sure we want to do that but then i heard that it was actually the reverse was that she was hired to do that part but she was so good at it in her improvisation that they taught her how to do the puppetry so she could do the mouth while she was improving. she's performing she's the performing now. the mouth yeah. Uh, because she's improving a lot of the dialogue they wanted her to be able to so we didn't have to post match it you know so I was like, okay, that makes sense. So we, we salvaged the entire performance is all production. Mm-hmm. And then funnily enough, we brought her in uh, for the foreigns of the, all the international mixes, because there's a few lines where she says like, you know, droid is ready and like right. where it's in English. And so we had her phonetically learn How all many the different, different it was like all of the main ones, all of them. She so she's like, also the voice yeah. of Babu Frick in yeah. every foreign language version. Of the film. So we just went through versions. it over it. We went to uh, Shepperton at the end. We I go over and uh, we sort of supervise the initial mixes for that, uh, for all the internationals, which we have set up over there at Shepperton. And so we had, and she's in, she's in uh, the UK. So we were able to bring her down in and she just, we had a specialist on the phone listening and then they would just go through every single one and she phonetically did the languages and she nailed it. She's, and she's a really talented voice actor as well as actor in general. So that was fun to have Babu Frick in there and then have a, have, have Babu Frick live all the way to the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. It was great too. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. But uh, Babu, I'm trying to think of anything else uh, really new that, gosh, that. That, that moment where, uh, where Leia dies and that sort of um, force, uh, kind of a force connect moment, I guess, between yes. Kylo and, and, and Leia, that whole sequence was a fun uh, evolution sound wise there that because there's the music is a very minimal thing in that moment and I think the music actually goes out it goes to one little tone yeah. for a little bit yeah and the way we constructed and this is again this is collaboration this is JJ this mm-hmm. is you know Chris Carbozio and myself um, uh, Marianne Brandon uh, the way the waves crash matching on the cuts there's sort of a heartbeat element with the waves crashing um, the way the ambiences sort of trade off hmm. and then kind of go very minimal in that moment. 
Uh, and then finally Leia's breath, the way her final exhale, and it kind of carries back over to the scene. It, it, it just ties all those cuts back and forth right. really nicely. And my favorite thing in that little moment, it's just a small thing where you cut back and you see Kylo's own sword sticking out of him with Ray's hand on it. There's no sound for that. It, yeah. It's just totally quiet right there, even though the, you know, the sword's like right in your face. I love that because yeah. it's so much more powerful. It's just like this stark, like, oh my, you know, yeah. he's, he's dead, basically. She's right. killed him. Right. Um, and then when she pulls it out, you kind of come back to reality. I love that moment for yeah. some reason. Yeah, that's nice. But those Force Connect moments, I, I absolutely. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing to me about the Force Connect moments is that that through the films, that's given you guys some really interesting yeah, opportunities yeah. to play. Yeah. Connecting them through the force like that. Yeah, and we we definitely, and he took it, you know, JJ amped it up way huge in this one because they actually could touch each other. And, he, and they have a sword he pulls fight. The, you know, the, the necklace. Physical from elements her. are going back yeah. and forth yeah. as well. Right. Yeah. That's how he finds out that she's actually on in, in, yeah. in, his, in his bedroom on the Death yeah. Star, right? right. Or on, the, uh, on the Star Destroyer. That's right. So how do you so how do you approach that? Are you doing anything in terms of like are they sharing ambiences as well from a sound perspective? How are you how do you build those force yeah, sequences? It's a similar to, uh, approach to what I was uh, talking about with the Leia moment, where the ambiences kind of share and then they kind of become one thing. Um, the the sounds within that space that connect space are different. So the sword fight, all the sound effects of the lightsabers. The, 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 the swishes and the clashes and all those moments are not traditional saber yeah. sounds. They're all unique right. sounds to that weird space. Um, and that was, again, that was um, a thing that we came up with with JJ. That, is that an editorial thing or is that a mixing thing? Are you, are it's you, editorial. It is. Editorial. Yeah. Well, so there's no, there's you're a mixing you're creating different. You're using different sound. It's, it's different sounds altogether. But I mean, and then from the mixing standpoint, you know, there's, um, there's layers and layers of reverbs that yeah, we're and we Yeah, and we, pre would, we would cut dialogue lines to pre-delay, like pre-verb into the each. Right. So it's like coming in, no, 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 yeah. no, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's, it's, it's, a, it's a, we're playing around with the dialogue, we're right. playing around, even with the Foley footsteps, there's everything in that space is completely unique and different than real space. It's supposed to completely take you out. And then in both of those moments, uh, there's always that hard snap back to reality. Yeah, right. And you, you, you immediately kind of realize that you were just someplace else. Right. Well, you guys have had a long, long run with Star Wars. Yeah. Just give, just tell us a little bit about when you started um, and how long you've been working on Star Wars. Uh, I think the first, well, I started here in 1990. So that's uh, this year's 30 years. Um, in fact, this room that we're in was one of my first job interviews, which is kind of weird. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, the first Star Wars thing I did was working on, because uh, I started on the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles where we were testing, right. we were getting that ready to, to uh, use this digital technology that we were developing here called SoundDroid. We used that um, on Young Indy, which was sort of the testing ground for the prequel movies. George sure. knew he wanted to make more movies. And so this was, you know, we were doing that on a TV show. Um, but then the first Star Wars thing I think I worked on was I helped on some of the special the editions. special editions yeah. that came out, what, in 97? Like 97, yeah, so it was like 96, I was think I was working on them. Right. Um, and then after that, I, I forged a relationship with Ben Burt, and uh, we did all the prequels, and we remastered the movie. The 4, 5, and 6, we remastered several times, actually, like mm -hmm. for yeah, DVD, DVD then Blu-ray, Blu and then just most recently, we did an, a home Atmos and a theatrical Atmos version for... D+. Plus. Uh, for D+, plus, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, all the prequel movies, and then it just so happened that the first director out of the gate for the new Disney era was J.J. Abrams, and we'd already had a relationship with him from the Star from Trek Star films. Trek, right. And uh, we started doing that, and then it became that we were the Star Wars guys after that. You know, mm -hmm. we kind of been the keepers of the library and the, and the holocron here, and just hiring new people in and, and having that happen. And having Ben Burt here is a fantastic resource. Right. Yeah. yeah, just shepherding all the new directors coming in and letting them have Star Wars as part of their toolbox and the sound, and that's what we did. I, I came in on episode two on Attack of the Clones. Matt hired me uh, out of, I was production at the time, working as a boom operator. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I did that for like six or seven years, and uh, boom and, and, and utility cable. And um, Matt hired me on Attack of the Clones as his apprentice for, for um, for the show, for mainly assisting Matt and, and Ben. Um, and then just kind of stayed with the Star Wars uh, train um, 
for, I guess it's almost been 19 years now. From apprentice to Academy Award nominee. How about that? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and you guys, and you guys juggled this with Mandalorian, which is pretty, yeah. pretty amazing. And yeah. Congratulations. You guys won the, uh, the golden reel at the, at the Mipsies. Yeah. Yeah. For the yeah. Mandalorian. Yeah. I mean, we have to, uh, you know, mention Bonnie Wilde, who's really the, the heavyweight champion on that show. She mixes yeah. the show. She mixes and cuts the show. Yeah, she I cuts see. all the, the, the effects for the show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have a great team of folks here at Skywalker. So, yeah, there was Mandalorian and the Clone Wars new season that we're, that's going to be coming out, and uh, a couple other little ancillary things, yeah. a, a video game, all going on at the same time. So, of course. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. For the looping thing, I was running around and doing both those shows with my little looping package, but I tried to make it work so we could, you know, like maximize our airplane tickets to, <laughs> to New York. I think I went to New York like every week. But, uh, did you end up looping Taika Waititi for? Uh, I did. Yeah, we should. I, 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 we should have some off off yeah. the record conversation about that because he's a nut. Oh my gosh, so much fun. So fun. Yeah, we recorded him at uh, Playa Vista where the editorial right. offices were, and yeah, great. All because his old his old droid performance was it was looped, and he is he's hilarious and offbeat and but super professional at the same time so that was a great day he was one of the first recipients of the the dolby sound fellowship for uh, a movie that he did called oh. hunt for the wilder people oh cool oh, and wow. we were we were in post on that yeah. when he got hired to direct thor ragnarok nice oh, so God. a few weeks later we were at sundance and we were doing some press and i was just sitting off to the side and somebody asked him you know how did the dolby fellowship come about and and how did you receive this and he just turns to me and he says, well, I met Glenn at a massage parlor in Bangkok. Nice. <laughs> How? He could have been a stand-up comic. Yeah, if he had 100%. A, if he had yeah. been a very talented film yeah. director. No, he is funny. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to, uh, thank you. to thank sit you, down man. and talk with us about uh, Star Wars. If you guys didn't miss the conversation that we had a month ago, yeah. uh, if you missed it, uh, that's also up on Dolby's YouTube channel. Um, and we had a lot of fun talking about the... What was the Mc, the the, Mc, the McClunky. McClunky? The McClunky. McClunky. Yes. Yeah. As well as lots of other Star Wars related <laughs> topics. It's a good it's a good companion piece to this yeah. more sober conversation. Yeah, we didn't drink. We didn't have wine. We didn't there. have wine like we had oh. last night. Oh well, it's it's eleven o'clock in the oh, morning. True. true. <laughs> but thanks for tuning in. It's been uh, it's been fun having you guys, and Thank congratulations you. on your well deserved nomination. Thank and, you very much, Glenn. Uh, absolutely, you. it's always good to talk with you. Thanks again for uh, tuning in. This is Glenn Kaiser from Dolby Institute and the Soundworks Collection. Until next time.